and oh, well, there will probably be a couple more, uh, a couple more late comments. But um, I'm just going to go ahead and start. So hi everybody, my name is Paul Meninato. I'm here uh, to give the presentation, Creative Descent, Why Imagination is Critical for Social Change. So we're going to talk about why we need to be creative and innovative in order to change the world, right? So we're trying to create social change. Is that going to happen by uh, using old methods? Or do we need to like invent new things? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. So that's basically the whole idea of the presentation. I want to start off by telling you guys my story so that you understand where I'm coming from and why I'm doing this research. So I was uh, passionate about social change from a very young age. I'm from Argentina, um, but I live in the US. And um, yeah, so Argentina is a very politicized country. And I've been interested in politics since I was very little. When I was like 12 years old, I was yelling at other students for like eating meat, for eating dead animals. Um, when I was 14, I like got um, a bunch of students from my middle school to go out and do a walkout, and then we were like chanting during the tension the next day. It was pretty fun. And then um, when yeah, I organized around LGBT rights all through high school, and then when I got into college, I uh, joined the Occupy movement, and I would go to march after march after march. I was super passionate, but I had no idea what I was doing. I was so passionate about social change that um, my like my face just randomly got on the cover of the website of the New York Times without me actually like achieving anything significant. I was just at a protest. Um, and this is actually pretty common for a lot of the people at Occupy, since it was a lot of the same people. Um, so, yeah, but it didn't actually change anything, as far as I'm aware. I just wasn't seeing the results of my work. So I actually, um, I actually burned out, and I left the movement. I and decided to focus on my studies. I was in college at the time. I didn't organize at all for like nearly three years. And then three years later, I um, did some paintings about um, Argentina's military dictatorship. Um, and this was actually part of a research project. So let me give you guys a little bit of um, background information about the project. So in Argentina, we had 30,000 people go missing. They were disappeared by the government. This was during the Red Scare. Um, so they were, there was a lot of fear of communism. They were trying to wipe out leftist ideology. And I really like to like start off by telling the story, these stories, because I think it's really important for us to be aware of how much people have sacrificed for social justice. Um, so you can, you guys can read more about the different stories here. But this is um, actually let me tell you guys about Alice. So um, when the dictatorship started, she realized what was going on. She realized there were people that were starting to get disappeared. Um, her and some of the mothers of people who were disappeared during the dictatorship started organizing around this issue. And then um, she was actually a nun, so she didn't even have a kid that was a part of the that was disappeared. Um, her and along with about a dozen other activists actually got disappeared for their activism. So I think it's really important to keep that in mind when it comes to our activism. And the whole point of this project was to, to raise awareness about what happened. Um, and I think with, I love this project because I think it like really illuminates a lot of things that are really important for activists to know. Um, but at the same time, I think like when it comes to our work, I could have taken it a couple steps farther. And I will talk to you guys more about how that could have happened um, as we get on with the presentation. But now I want to um, talk, oh, and actually, let me go back. Um, and actually, after I got done with this project, I worked on the 2016 election. Um, I had just watched Earthling, so I was very passionate about veganism. But um, I, it was the 2016 election. I live in the US. Trump was like, we were scared that Trump was going to become president. So I dedicated a whole year of my life to the campaign. Um, and then obviously after the election, I felt really burnt out and drained. And I was really upset that obviously with the results and everything that happened. Um, so I decided to quit my job and do research about effective activism because clearly um, the left is not very effective in the US um, and also to paint. 
So that's the type of research that I'm doing now. One of the resources that I found as soon as I started doing my research was the Center for Creative Activism. If you go on their website, they have a really great webinar series that I would recommend to everybody. So if you want um, some resources that's going to go over some of this material more in depth, that's a great resource. One of the things that they mentioned uh, during one of their lectures was the fact that um, when we're most activists uh, and organizers tend to focus on the problems. Um, now I want to give you guys a little bit of a different example. Let's say that before the presentation, I'm thinking to myself, don't choke, don't choke, don't choke. What am I going to do? I'm going to choke, right? So when it comes to our activism, why is it something, why, why is our focus so much on the problem? Why is our focus on, we need to end this, we need to end that, we need to stop this. We, are we going to stop things that way? No. Not necessarily. So we want to be focused not on the problems, but on the solutions, um, and actually on the process, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. Um, and the most effective leaders for social justice movements understood this. Obviously here is MLK. He had his famous speech, I have a dream. He didn't get famous for saying, I'm gonna stop racism. He got famous for giving a beautiful speech um, that was obviously very creative and innovative at the time that painted a picture for people that they could, of like the world that they wanted to achieve. So he didn't just yeah, he wasn't an angry protester that was yelling at everybody and saying like, oh, this is wrong, that's wrong. Um, he actually got up on the stage and he like inspired millions of people to go out um, and become politically active. So this is something that's important to take note of. And the other thing that important social justice movements generally focus on is um, organizing as opposed to activism. So who here knows, do you guys know what organizing is? Does anybody? Raise your hand if you know what organizing is. Okay, so no, not many of you. So we're actually gonna go over that, so that's great. Um, so when it comes to activism, the focus is on the act. So on what you're doing to stop injustice or to like, um, yeah, to change the world, to bring out the social change that you want. When it comes to organizing, we're focusing on the collective and actually organizing um, a campaign designed to reach a particular objectives and goals. With organizing, our focus is not on ourselves, but on um, activating entire communities. Um, and um, also like recruiting and engaging new members is obviously something that's really important. So how you draw new people into the movement and then also leadership development. How do we um, like basically train other people to become effective leaders so that it's not just one person doing all of the work um, and it's actually like a bunch of people that way. A, the power is shared among a collective as opposed to one person. Um, and then on top of that, um, when somebody needs to step back, they can do that, right? Like if you guys are obviously like there's times when you're doing a project, when you're like really overwhelmed, really stressed out, there's a lot going on in your life, and you need to be able to take a step back, and then somebody needs to be able to step forward um, and assume that role that you're doing, and it happens obviously to everybody. So what we don't want is for people to get burnt out um, and then have to leave because of that. And I think that's where um, organizing can really take us to the next step. When it comes to organizing, it's not just a random thing, there's a structure to it. So you have a goal, that's your end point, that's like basically your final goal, what you want to get to in the end. Um, for the vegan movement, the goal would be um, to create a vegan world. Um, an objective would be steps needed to take, uh, to reach our goal, so stepping stones. A good example of a good, an objective uh, for the vegan movement might be to make sure that there's, um, I don't know, like in the Philly school district, students that want to go vegan. I work in, live and work in Philly, by the way. In the Philly school district, students that want to go vegan don't necessarily have vegan options. So a good objective would mean uh, to make sure that everybody, that there's vegan options served at every school cafeteria within the movement. And this is an achievable goal that we can achieve within like the next three years or the next four years, maybe even sooner. Um, a campaign is the, a series of activities that you're taking to reach that objective. So it's the name that you're giving to your strategy. 
Um, so you might have the get, um, yeah, get vegan options at the school cafeteria campaign. You might want to give it a nicer name, but yeah. Um, and then you have your strategy, which is your plan of action. So how are you actually going to get to your objective? And then finally, you have your tactics. So your tactics are your methods and actions that can help you reach your goal. This is where we can get really creative. Um, so I want to just dissect a little bit about what tactics mean before we talk about how to how we can use them. So um, there's several main types of tactics. There's more than these, but I just want to, this is like, an, like a 50 minute presentation, so we're just going to go over three. So you have direct action. That's a tactic that directly impacts the issue that you're trying to change. So um, a good example of, a lot of people think that direct action means uh, going out and getting arrested, and that's actually not what that means. Anybody that thinks that going to a random highway and then blocking yourself down onto it is a good example of direct action doesn't know what direct action means. Now, if you're going and you're locking yourself down uh, with other activists onto a road that is either leading to a uh, Trump rally or a slaughterhouse, is that direct action? Yes. Yes. But um, direct action doesn't require arrest. What about a boycott? So for example, saying, I'm not going to eat any more animal products. Does that directly impact the issue at hand? Yes. Yes. So going vegan is actually an example of uh, direct action. It's also an example of grassroots. So grassroots tactics means that you're mobilizing a group of people. So grassroots means it's not just one person. It's like a whole, like a whole community or a whole group of people. Um, so good, good um, examples of grassroots can mean things like outreach, protesting, getting a group of, group of people to go to a protest, or like going to schools to talk to students about veganism, educating people, handing out leaflets, etc. And then we also have institutional changes. A good example of an institutional change for um, for like the vegan movement would be uh, getting vegan options in the school cafeteria. Obviously, we need to have vegan options available everywhere in order to um, for people to for more people to want to go vegan. Um, so as there's more vegan options, more people are going to be more are going to be open to the idea of going vegan as opposed to I don't know people being scared by this idea because they don't know anybody that's vegan. I don't know about you guys, but when I was 14, I tried to go vegan, and there were no options at the school cafeteria. There were no, the, I, had, I didn't know any other vegans. I had no social support, um, and it didn't end well for me. I had to go back to eating um, eggs and dairy because I didn't have any other option. Um, and obviously now I'm vegan, but um, at that time, that was a big hurdle for me. Um, so these institutional changes really make it easier for people to go vegan and they help people uh, be more open to these ideas. When it comes to tactics, uh, if they lack specificity, they are unlikely to create change. We'll talk about this more in a minute. Um, the context of your tactics is so important. So you can't just, again, you can't just go and get arrested on a random road leading wherever. It has to, it has to lead somewhere. Um, or, um, yeah, so it has to be leading somewhere. The other thing about tactics is they are the most effective when they are new. So when you are standing outside doing a protest, um, and you've been doing the same protest for a month, like we were doing during the Occupy days, where we literally had a protest going for a month. Is there any reason why the media would want to come to that protest? Is that news? No. So that's actually not new, so that's a good example of why tactics are most effective when they are new. If we keep doing the same thing over and over, it's going to be less newsworthy, it's going to be less likely to catch um, the attention of not just the news, but people in general. Um, if you do something that's new, people are going to be like, wow, that's really cool. Whereas if you do um, the same thing over and over, that's not news people are very unlikely to care. And then we also want to have a diversity of different <coughs> tactics. So there's a lot of debate within the vegan movement of like, which tactics are more effective? Um, and actually, so, some tactics are ineffective, 
but when it comes to tactics, the more variety, the more diversity we have, the better, because again, tactics are the most effective when they are new. So we don't want to just have one or two tactics. We want to have like a big toolbox to draw from. It's like if you're a painter and you're using like the same brush over and over, that's not actually, that's not what we want. We want new things. Um, so, and every single social justice movement um, that was successful created their own tactics. This would be a really good example. This was during the World War sit-ins. Um, these four guys sat down at a whites-only lunch counter, and because their act was directly disrupting um, the fact that, was like directly disrupting segregation, right? Four black men sitting down at a, a whites-only lunch counter. Because this tactic was directly impacting the issue at hand, it's considered direct action. Um, it was new, it was innovative, it got a ton of press coverage, um, and these protests just like exploded, just kind of like the these sit-ins, they exploded, much like Occupy did uh, when we occupied the Brooklyn Bridge. And with Occupy, the reason it got so much attention in the very beginning was uh, because our tactics were new, our tactics were innovative, um, and that fizzled out fairly quickly. But with these guys, they kept on, not these guys in particular, but with the civil rights movement, they kept on using new tactics, which is what allowed them to get these campaigns to succeed. Um, and yeah, I just want to read this quote. Insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Um, so I actually heard that it's not by Albert Einstein, but it's really still a great quote. So. I mean, it just really doesn't make any sense that we're going to do the same thing over and over, and somehow magically, that's going to get us to the change that we want. That's really not, that's, I mean, you can try that, but that's unlikely to work. The other thing that we want to focus on is on our process as opposed to the outcome. So we have social justice issues that have been going on for thousands of years. Are they going to change overnight? No. No. So they're not going to change overnight. So if we're focusing entirely on the problem, like if you're spending all day thinking about how many thousands of animals are getting killed each day, is that going to change the number of animals that are getting killed each day? No. no. So we don't want to focus on the outcome and how slowly it's happening. We want to focus on the process. So making sure, that, and there's two things about that. One is making sure that we're being effect, effective. You don't have control over what other people do. Um, I mean, you have limited, you can influence other people. But you don't have control over the outcome as much as you have control over your own actions. So if you have a healthy process, then you're going to be more likely to want to engage um, with your activism for a longer period of time, you're gonna be more effective, um, and you're probably gonna get more out of your activism. And there's a lot of things that activists um, and organizers get out of the work that we do that aren't necessarily um, leading to our final outcome. Uh, like, for example, how many people traveled to come here? How many people have traveled because of their activism? How many people have met, made amazing friends um, through their activism? that they will like never take for granted. Okay, cool. So yeah, so basically most of us have made um, like new friends through our activism, we've traveled through our activism, and that's something that's obviously really important is because of the work that we do, um, we get a lot of other things, like uh, we, we get a lot of other things out of it that aren't necessarily leading to that outcome, um, and that's something that for us makes our lives more enriching. Um, and it, might not like help start a vegan world right away, um, but that is something that's important to focus on and to like enjoy it as opposed to um, yeah, as opposed to thinking about um, hello, what uh, the changes that are not happening. Um, and also focusing on the process and being creative helps us turn hot anger into cold anger. So this is a term by Saul Alinsky. Um, he's um, he wrote Rules for Radicals. He's like he writes theory. He, he writes about the theory of change um, and how social justice movements work. Great author. If you want to check out that resource. So you have um, hot anger. So a good example of hot anger would be like the really passionate vegan that wants to change the world but goes out and yells at everybody. Um, and hot anger is usually guided by pure emotion. It lacks a strategy and it's rarely effective, right? How effective is it to go out and just start yelling at people? 
Not very. Um, so cold anger is more methodical. So instead of just getting angry at people and lashing out, uh, we're channeling, you're, we're taking a step back, like just take a deep breath, um, and then you channel that anger, you channel that passion that you have um, into a strategy, and that's um, often what's the most effective in social justice movements. It also helps us achieve sustainable activism. Um, so it helps prevent things like burnout and secondary traumatic stress. Do you guys know what secondary traumatic stress is? Yeah, okay, cool. For anybody that doesn't know, a lot of activists actually get traumatized from the work that we're doing, especially, not a lot, most of us will get traumatized from the work that we're doing, um, especially animal rights activists since we're exposed to a lot of graphic footage. Um, so this is a very big issue within um, the, um, yeah, within the vegan movement and actually a lot of symptoms of um, STS can actually relate to hot anger. So a lot of the way vegans lash out is actually like symptoms of STS. Um, so the two things are like interchangeable. Um, and yeah, the other thing that's important with sustainable activism is long-term activists have a greater capacity to generate change, right? If you're in the movement for 10 years, are you gonna know more about how to change things? Yeah. yeah, you're going to have a lot more resources, you're going to have a lot more knowledge, you're going to have a lot more connections, and you're going to be much more effective. So we want to keep activists in, in the long run, um, and creativity, um, and also like guiding our emotions into things like hot anger by focusing on uh, the process and making sure that we're being effective is um, like really important to keep activists engaged. The other thing is a lot of activists um, are and organizers are um, reacting to issues as opposed to um, like leading the change. So for example, a lot of people are like, okay, let's try to stop this from happening or let's try to like, are they reacting to things that people are saying on the internet? We want to lead. So we never want to be in a position, that, I mean, it's fine to react and sometimes we need to, um, but in order to create social change, we need to like, instead of fighting bills in Congress, we want to be the ones introducing bills in Congress um, to try to, or parliament, wherever you live, to try to um, create these social changes. The other thing is uh, we want to build bridges with other social justice movements um, and uh, being creative in our approach gives us more leeway in order to do this. I think a huge problem within um, the vegan movement right now is illustrated really well um, by my friend and colleague, Christopher Sebastian. If you guys aren't following him on Facebook, I highly suggest you do so. He says that the movement for animal liberation has relied heavily on the perspectives of cisgendered straight white men as leaders, which is an unusual approach to liberation. It makes much more sense for people who come from oppressed backgrounds to be the architects of freedom. So looking around the room, um, there's not really a lot of diversity here. Most people here um, are white, and this is obviously a problem through um, creativity. We can uh, try to build some of these networks, um, and we can also try to create groups um, that are addressing multiple issues. A good example would be the group Food Not Bombs. They go out um, and feed, uh, yeah, like basically, usually the homeless, but um, just like marginalized communities in general, um, and they bring vegan food to them. So this helps, and they usually get are getting food from like supermarkets that are, are about to throw it out, before, like right as like the food is getting expired. Um, so they're addressing issues related to food waste um, and also uh, food insecurity while also promoting the vegan message. So there's a lot of room to help build these bridges within the movement through creativity. Um, now I wanna get into cognitive science. This is the last part that we're gonna talk about before getting into looking at a little bit at art. Um, so when it comes to changing uh, people's perceptions of issues, most people have already made up their minds. Our worldview tends to be shaped by our culture as opposed to our facts. When it comes to facts, they very rarely sell the ideology. Usually when people um, encounter information that conflicts with their worldview, they tend to dismiss it. Do we see a lot of this in the vegan movement? Yeah. Vegan yeah. Movement, yeah. Facts? yeah. Um, so that's why. Um, and also confronting our bias is a really uncomfortable process. And on top of that, as people, like we're social creatures, we wanna do whatever other people are doing. Um, so we kinda just wanna like, we're kinda like sheep, we wanna like follow the herd. Um, so this, um, 
like th th this is a very strong like current like norm within people. This is like a very strong psychological barrier that we need to overcome. Thankfully, um, art can help us get there and creativity. So there's several strategies that we can use to overcome these barriers. Number one is we can create new narratives. So a good example of a new narrative is in the US, we obviously have a lot of issues with Trump. Um, so a lot of people, instead of going there and being like, let's talk about Hillary, um, they start talking to them and being uh, like talking to Trump supporters and saying like, what are some issues that you care about? Um, and then they'll list them. Um, and a lot of the times that way, they'll be able to like get people to vote for other candidates as opposed instead of Trump. Um, by like listening to them and actually having a conversation um, and also um, coming up with a narrative that fits into their worldview. Um, although I'm not saying all Trump supporters are like that, that's definitely not the case in all cases. Um, we also want to ask questions. This is called the Socratic method. Um, if you're more, if, if you're really interested in the Socratic method, Earthling Ed has a whole YouTube video about it. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Basically, what you do is you ask people questions instead of um, telling them the information. So if you tell somebody, um, "Baby cows get killed to produce milk," they're gonna stare at you like you're crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. But if you ask somebody, what do you need to do to get a baby cow to produce milk? Or not to get a baby cow, to get a cow to produce what milk. What happens to baby cow milk? Yeah, exactly. So you ask them, what, what do you need to do to get, the, to get a cow to produce milk? And then their efforts are like, oh, you just milk the other udders. And then it's like, well, no, they're mammals. They don't just produce milk on their own. And then they're like, oh, you need to get them pregnant. Um, and then uh, they're like, and then you can ask them, well, if you take the milk, what happens to the babies? And then they'll pretty much figure it out from there. The other thing that we can do is we can present shocking information. Um, however, when it comes to things like slaughterhouse footage, that can often backfire. But when people see information that is really shocking, they tend to um, like reevaluate their ideas. How many people here went vegan because they saw something that was really shocking? Okay, there we go. So a lot of people, about a third of the people in the room. So obviously this is a really good, effective tactic. I personally went vegan because I was vegetarian and I saw a picture of a baby cow um, getting slaughtered because they don't produce milk. Um, and that's pretty much what did it for me. Um, that, well, not, I didn't go vegan right away, but I started questioning everything that I knew about eating animals. Um, and that eventually led me to veganism. So that actually happens to a lot of people. We also want to use our active listening skills. So when it comes to having a conversation with somebody, we're trying to open up the space to be able to talk about these issues. Are people going to want to listen to us if we're not listening to them? No. no. Um, so we want to be able to make sure that we're actually listening to people and listening to what they, they have to say. The other thing is when you are, um, so when you're using your active listening skills, um, you're better able to, um, like kind of, I guess, like get inside their head. So you're better able to understand their perspective, understand where they're, where they're coming from, and you're also better able to debate them um, and ask questions that you think might um, help you um, overcome these, like it, you're gonna be better able to ask questions um, that are gonna get them to think about what they're really saying. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit about protests and theater. So th this is the fun part. Um, so let's say you go, to a, you go to a protest. Everybody is chanting the same three chants over and over and over again. Are you gonna, are you gonna be really engaged? Or are you gonna be really enjoying uh, the protest? No. Okay, what if, what if you go to a protest and there's like a dance party with drums, people are <laughs> chanting like really exciting, funny chants. Are you, are you gonna wanna go back? No. Uh, I mean, I want to go back to pro uh, protest, but I don't want to go back home. So. Okay, yeah. So you're gonna you're gonna go to want to go back to the protest. So um, and this is Emma Goldman, by the way. She's a famous anarchist from the turn of the century. She's really awesome. awesome. If you wanna check her out as well, um, she's one of my idols. Um, so yeah, so she says, if I can't dance, I don't want to be a part of your revolution, right? Yeah. When it comes to or um, any kind of dissent. Um, we want to make it fun. So this is another area where creativity really comes in, is if we are just doing the same thing over and over, that's kind of boring. If we're having fun, if we're enjoying, that leads us to enjoy the process, and then we want to stay in the movement longer. So that's 
basically what I'm getting at here. Now I want to talk about art and activism um, and actually go a little bit beyond raising awareness. This is where I started with my pieces of um, the art related to the desaparecidos from the Argentine military dictatorship. They, um, so like they could have, I, I wish that I could have taken things a little bit further and instead of just raising awareness, um, actually done something, like actually figured out how to, like for example, mobilize people or open up spaces to discuss certain topics. Um, so when it comes to um, our work, discussing the problem rarely leads to institutional change and stopping short of action undermines our capacity. Um, so when it comes to art, artists usually just, they just want to start a conversation. Um, and that's actually often not enough to actually bring about social change. Um, and we can actually yeah, open up the space to discuss controversial or censored topics. Um, mobilize groups of people and bypass social barriers that prevent discourse. I think a really good example is right here. This is a protest in China where over there in some parts of the country, protesting is heavily restricted and uh, you can actually get arrested for protesting. So what they started doing is, um, which they actually now made illegal because the government is yeah. finding it threatening, is they started doing pro hiding protests as performance art. So this is an example of some performance art that was disguised as a protest. Um, so basically, it's an environmental protest and they're all like getting married with gas masks on. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, so that this actually it gets more attention, obviously, and then on top of that, it um, actually opens up the space to talk about this topic while mobilizing a group of people. Um, but obviously now they can't do it anymore in some parts of the country because it's illegal to do performance art, so, <laughs> which also like makes it like makes people realize how ridiculous it is that like some types of art is getting banned, and also shows us that it's actually effective. Um, now I want to look at this piece by Michelle Angela Ortiz. Uh, she's an artist in Philly, um, and she um, organizes around immigrant rights. So basically what she did here is, uh, this is in front of the ICE office. You guys probably don't know, you guys don't know what ICE is. So um, ICE is the government institution that's in charge of deporting people in the US. So they're in charge of deporting people. She got um, undocumented immigrants <coughs> to paint this in front of the ICE office. She actually got a permit from the, from the city. So basically they were able to put this message of we're human beings risking our lives for our families and our future in front of the ICE office. They had to stare at this message for a month um, and the people, the undocumented immigrants who were like, have been marginalized and like have a hard time speaking out because they're actually scared to, um, were able to put this there and get this message to the people um, that like, yeah, to the people who work in ICE without actually risking um, their well-being. So that's pretty amazing. This is another artist from Philadelphia. This is Pepon Osorio. He works um, around um, issues of, yeah, different issues related to racism and economic inequality. Um, this is about an, a very local issue within the Philly school district. The city is running out of funding to be able to put students in, um, yeah, they're, they're running out of funding so they keep on closing down the schools. Um, so this is from a school that got closed down. He got students from that school and their parents and teachers to, um, and like other community members, to transport a whole classroom into Tyler School of Art where I went to school um, and do an art installation. And the students were involved in the process um, and they were, um, in this next slide you can see a little bit, um, where they were, um, like talking about how the, these issues affected them. So this um, gives marginalized people who don't, aren't normally seen, aren't normally heard, um, it gives them a voice. And then on top of that, it gets people talking in a way that they probably wouldn't be from just reading a news article. And it gives you a very personal perspective into what these people are going through as opposed to this is what's going on in the news. Um, so yeah, but unfortunately the school district, despite a lot of pressure from a lot of organizers, is still shutting down schools and they are still not um, giving money to, like the, the state of Pennsylvania is not giving enough money to the school district. 
Now let's talk about art and veganism. So I'm going to start this section with a quote from Dr. Joy. So she says, the best thing we can do is to ideally create an environment where they are open to our message. So when it comes to art, it's generally, and also just any kind of creative um, activism, it's generally more effective is we, if we're going to create an environment where people actually want to listen to what we have to say. Art is generally less threatening, and then also through storytelling and narratives, like for example, telling stories about baby cows, um, like going into like a slaughterhouse, for example. Um, people might be more interested in reading that than just hearing, go vegan. Um, and also, of course, the facts don't tell the ideology. So when it comes to art and veganism, art provides a really great way for us to get around that. Um, there's a lot of artists working around vegan issues, like for example, Joanne MacArthur, she, most of you guys know her, she goes into um, these places where um, animals are being systematically abused, um, and she photographs them so people can actually see them. So this gives the animals visibility. Um, there's also obviously um, earthlings, I'm assuming, how many people here went vegan because of earthlings? Okay. <laughs> okay, so there's a couple of you. So a lot of people do go vegan after, for me, earthlings was like the last straw um, that actually got me to go vegan. So a lot of people do go vegan because of this documentary. Um, so this is a really good example of how film can um, get people to go vegan. This is Suko. Um, again, she gets the vegan message out there through her paintings. Um, and obviously this is a really strong piece with like a baby cow about to get stunted. Um, there's also <laughs> other examples. So um, right now a really big trend on social media are influencers. Um, and this girl, Supreme Banana, she's awesome. She literally makes like videos of herself eating vegan junk food. And then people watch it because it's entertaining and they learn about veganism. So that's, I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's obviously a really creative way to get people interested. And then I just want to end uh, by showing you guys a little bit about my work. Um, so this is uh, a piece that I made. This is um, eggs inside of a chicken. Um, so this is what um, egg laying hens look like when they've been um, cut open. What happens is we've been breeding these birds for thousands of years um, to be constantly ovulating. Um, out in the wild, they'd be getting, um, they'd be ovulating like a woman, like a couple times, like yeah, like 12 to 15 times a year. Um, these chickens are laying 300 eggs a year. So that's like basically the equivalent of uh, getting your period every day. And yeah, so that's what these chickens go through. When I started talking to people about this, they were like, you're crazy. So I started painting it and now they believe me. <laughs> so that's, kind of, that's the idea behind this piece. Um, with, and then the other idea that I had was to, um, a lot of people don't wanna actually look at what's going on inside factory farms and slaughterhouses. So what I started doing it doing was to paint, uh, like try to make the images look pretty so that people would actually want to look at them. So it's these pretty images, but when you actually look behind, like when you actually start analyzing them, it's like a baby cow waiting to die inside of a veal crate. So that's, yeah. Um, and then the other thing that I, the other project that I started doing is um, I'm uh, partnering with my friends uh, Mahika and Rachel. Uh, we're doing a fundraiser for the Humane League. We're making 88 pieces for the 88 campaign, where um, basically we're making 88 pieces since 88% of animal, animals, 88% of land animals killed in agriculture are chickens. Um, so we're making these pieces, and if you guys want, um, you can actually, uh, if you donate more than $50 to any of our fundraising pages, you can actually get a drawing. So, um, and we don't get any of the money, it's like all going to the Humane League. And then finally, um, I have an ebook which actually covers most of the information that uh, you learned today, along with some more new, like some other information that I didn't have time to cover. So um, you can actually download it online for free. I can also send it to you, it's on my website, but if you um, don't wanna go on my website or you think you're gonna forget, you can actually just sign up for it right here. And yeah, um, and then this is, with this part of my work, um, I'm just, okay, yeah, I got it. Uh, with this part of my work, I'm just um, trying to, yeah, trying to like help other activists 
uh, with their advocacy, because obviously um, I'm not trying to focus on myself and my work. I want to use my work to inspire people and get the message out there. Um, but I also want to make sure that other activists have the same tools I do um, so that they can be more effective with their activism. So, yeah. So that's what I'm doing, and um, I'm going to pass this around. Um, there are two sides to it, um, and again, the ebook is free. And if anybody has any questions, uh, you can feel free to ask. So I'm going to open it up for Q&A.